and uh, welcome everybody to the second day of Virtual World Best Practice in Education Conference. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you today's keynote, Dr. Randall Sutler, with a the theme, Time Travel in the Metaverse, What's Old is New Again. And we're looking forward to his keynote. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Randall Sutler to you very trusted and long-term collaborate uh, team member in uh, on education as we've been working together for a good 13 year plus years. Makes and sense. before I introduce him to you, may I ask the audience kindly to also um, drop a little line, a one-liner into the text chat about your background. Are you, um, are you, we don't have any. Alvi, <laughs> she's asking for the speak easy. You said no to. Okay, um, apologies. Mm. Well, could you could you just drop us a one liner, <laughs> a one liner in the text chat, introducing yourself with just a very brief sort of background, as regards to your educational background. Um, highly appreciated. Now I'm going to introduce Dr. Randall Sadler to you. And uh, Dr. Randall Sadler is, a, and his avatar name is Randall Renoir, Renoir. Uh, is, <laughs> is Associate Professor of Linguistics and Director of TESL and ESL at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He teaches courses on collaboration, telecollaboration, virtual worlds, and language learning and is teaching L2 reading and writing. He has published in journals including Calico Journal, Recal, LLT, Computers and Education, ELT, and in numerous edited volumes. His books include Virtual Worlds, Telecollaboration and Language Learning by Peter Lang in 2012, the handbook of Informal Language Learning 2020, published by Wiley Blackwell, and New Ways in Teaching with Games 2020 and TESOL. He is the current president of Calico, the Computer Assisted Language Instruction Consortium. Randall and myself, we've been working together on education for a good 13 years. And it has been a very enjoyable teamwork indeed with many, many fond memories. Without further ado, over to you, Randall. It, it, oh, thank you so much, Heike. It, it always sounds uh, uh, so uh, weird <laughs> when, when you're presented uh, by someone else about uh, the, the things you've been doing when, when you know everybody else in the audience has done things that are just as interesting or and many times more so. Yeah, 13 years that we've been working together, which as I recall means I think we both started working together in Second Life when we were about uh, 20. Uh, is, is that right? She has no answer. Yes. She has no. Yes. <laughs> she has no answer to that. Uh, so my my topic for today, as, as Heike mentioned, is time travel in the metaverse. Is what is new, old again. Uh, and uh, fair fair warning, uh, I have some things to say about uh, this this latest term that is being thrown around all the time, uh, metaverse. And, and that's that's kind of the main focus uh, of my presentation today. If we have time, I'm hoping we can have more of a, an open conversation as well. Uh, some of you who have been on Edunation may or may not recognize the image uh, on this slide. Uh, that's actually a TARDIS, the interior of a TARDIS that we have up above Edunation. Uh, I did not build this TARDIS from scratch, by the way. I, I love building in Second Life, but this is one that I bought and it has all sorts of different rooms and passages to explore. So if you've not been there, uh, uh, ask us later uh, and we'll, uh, we'll show you how to get to, to Edunation and explore. We've got some, we've got some great stuff. Heike told me I had to push Edunation. Uh, so, so there you go. We, we love Edunation. It's for education. I'll talk about it a bit later. 
Uh, so uh, let me go ahead and get started. I, I think we'll, I'll have two parts here. The first part is kind of from me, and I hope if we have time, the second part will be from us, uh, because I think that all of us are probably doing some interesting things, whether it's in virtual worlds or VR or augmented reality, and I, I really would like to hear from other people. So part one of the talk for me will be about what, what is the metaverse? Does it exist? Where did it come from? How can we use it as educators if it, if it does exist? And part two, if we have time, I'd like for us to share our thoughts uh, and questions uh, and hear maybe about what you might be doing or using right now and, and, and how you're using it. So on this next slide, what I have here is a link and a QR code. So you might want to grab that now or put in the link now and and have that free. If you haven't used Padlet, Padlet is is just kind of a an online uh, bulletin board where you can double click on the screen to post a note. My thinking here is uh, if you want to uh, 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 <laughs> take a mental break while I'm talking, you might even put a few thoughts in there about what are you doing? Is there something you're using now, whether it's a virtual world or a VR environment, whatever the case may be, or do you have some some other things you're working on in there? Because I, I find at these conferences, the best thing is you learn so much from the talks, but also just the discussions you have with people you happen to meet. Uh, so I'd, I'd love to hear from people on that component. I'll have this link a bit later as well, just in case you missed it, although I saw it in chat too. So whenever I give a talk like this, one of the things to me that I like to do is take a look back because we often ignore where things came from. And I'm curious if, if anybody knows this. Uh, when did this all begin? 1972 is this picture started earlier than that. But this is a Plato 4 computer. And if, if you've ever heard of the Plato, Plato system, uh, you drop a quick note in the chat or something. I, I'm, I'm curious. Here we have 1972, uh, a display screen slightly bigger <laughs> than what we use today. And here you have this, this woman wearing some really 70s clothes and she's pointing at the computer screen. But here's the interesting thing. This is 1972. She's not pointing at the computer screen. That is a touch screen computer in 1972, which to me is absolutely mind blowing. So the Plato system was started right here where I am, the University of Illinois, uh, started in the very late 60s, really took off in the 70s. And much of what we think about today for online, it came from Plato. As you can see on this next slide, here's some of the things that the Plato system developed really for the first time. Uh, things like a touchscreen plasma monitor that you see here. Plato notes, that was the first message boards. Personal notes, that was emails beginning. Talkomatic was chat rooms beginning. Term notes was instant messaging, remote screen sharing. Here you see on the right hand side, all those little funky squiggles. Those were the first emoticons that all the kids are using today. Started back in the 70s. Online games like Star Trek Online, and online role play games like Dungeons and Dragons. And as you can see at the bottom, 12,000 hours more than that of courseware for languages, for sciences, all over the place. Uh, much of this was very you know, audio lingual in nature, I suppose. Uh, but 40, over 45 years ago, these things were taking place that, you know, and my favorite example is that touch screen. I remember when I f got my first iPhone, just <gasps> oh, amazing. At that time, not knowing that was, that was old stuff. Plato did it so long ago. So when we move forward from Plato, where 
where some of this idea is really beginning of what we might think of as a text-based metaverse, whatever a metaverse is. If we move forward, then some of you probably use things like MUDs, and I'll show you a MUD in a second. MUDs really started from uh, really some, some guys at that time who really were big players of Dungeons and Dragons, were going off to college, and they wanted a way to keep playing. So no video chat back then. So they created a MUD, which is a multi-user dungeon or domain. Uh, and one of the first, which is kind of pre-MUDs, was Colossal Cave Adventure. And another one, which is still around, actually is called British Legends, started in 1978. And again, if you, if you were in anything like this, you will know this. Uh, another popular one back in the day was Zork. Zork was the first one I actually played. But here we have two of these. Uh, there's British Legends, the one that's the dark screen. Colossal Cave Adventure is a light screen. The text -based, it's a text-based system uh, where you go in, you could explore. Later, you could play with other people, like in British Legends. A few years back, I took my students into British Legends during a class to show them how it worked. And one of my students literally uh, stabbed me in the back and, and murdered me during class, <laughs> which at least it was, it was in, the, in the game rather than in real life. So I can't complain too much. So this was the start again of this. Again, text-based, but more immersive. You're drawn into the story. And it continued on for education. I don't know if anybody here ever used a moo, which is a more advanced kind of a, of a mud, object oriented. And there used to be there used to be thousands of these. Uh, the school where I did my PhD, University of Arizona, uh, they had a moo called the Old Pueblo moo, and actually at one time I held office hours in there. Uh, in the old Pueblo Moo. Schmooze University was around a long time. I think maybe it finally disappeared, but it was around until pretty recently. What's the difference? Well, if, if you look here, here's another image, right? So you can see a Moo, it's still text-based, but the difference with these is uh, I could go to the, the administrator who called herself the Dungeon Master, uh, for the old Pueblo Moo and request a classroom space, text-based. I could customize that space textually, <laughs> however I wanted to, and I could have students come in and we could do text-based communication. So I would hold office hours. I also did some group student conferences in, in the Moo back in the day. It seems impossibly primitive now, uh, but it was, it, was a, it was a big change back then. In popular culture, we started to get things. I don't know if anybody ever saw this. Star Trek, the animated series. Uh, back in 1974, they had an episode. Uh, this was their recreation room, which they later called the holodeck in Star Trek The Next Generation. But here's where in pop culture, you start to see people entering this fully immersive environment that they could interact with, which is pretty metaverse -y, right? Uh, things are starting to change. Not too uh, long after that, we get this. I don't know if anybody ever uh, played in uh, this, this environment called Habitat. Right? Habitat was really the first, as you can see here, uh, kind of a, a two-day, two-day, 2D, visual environment where you could go in and you could interact with other people. Here you see Terry and Kathy, and they're in one of the scenes in Habitat, and they can meet and they can talk uh, and they can do things together. This is part of this system they called Quantum Link uh, that was designed. And again, it, it was so far ahead of its time. Uh, 1986, this is on the Commodore 64 computer, uh, developed by Lucasfilms, which, if, if that sounds familiar, it's because 
you know Star Wars, right? George Lucas, Lucas Films. So he helped to develop this system called Habitat, virtual community, graphically based. Look at all the stuff that was in Habitat. Email, chat, file sharing, news, instant messages, multiplayer games, <laughs> casino games, until that was banned as being illegal, online auctions, and shopping 18 years before Amazon and 10 years before Google. I see somebody had a Commodore. Yeah, I had a Commodore at one point, but I don't think I, I ever got into Habitat. Uh, I probably didn't have a decent enough connection to, to do that with my dial-in modem. But <clears throat> again, this is, this is kind of the trend. And it's, it's the same if we look back to what I showed you earlier with the Play-Doh 4 computer. Some of these leaps ahead happen, and then they're kind of, kind of lost. And then they get, quote, rediscovered by somebody who claims they're doing something new, even though <laughs> many, many times it's not actually something new. So if we keep going forward, some of you probably have been in Active Worlds before. Uh, that was released in 1995, eight years before Second Life. Right? And here's a immersive uh, 3D world that you can explore. There I am in the form of my avatar who looks like, I always think, uh, if people remember who Fabio was, the, the super male supermodel, kind of looks like Fabio in, in this case. But this, this environment, Active Worlds, yeah, I started my thesis there before Second Life, somebody says. Yeah, yeah, Active Worlds is still around. Um, but uh, this had a, especially in the early days, it had a very active education component. Uh, and it's, it, you know, it's, it's a very interesting place. Don't forget Myst. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, you mentioned Myst. When I was doing my first master's degree, master's in education in Spokane, Washington, one of the guys in the program uh, who I was good friends with said, uh, hey, uh, you want to come with me? We're going to stop by my house. I, I'll introduce you to my brothers. And I was like, oh, cool. And we go there, and he goes literally to the room above their parents' garage. And here are these two guys with a bunch of computer equipment. And they introduced me to this thing they're working on. And it was going to be this game you could go in and it was going to be so beautiful and graphically oriented. And it just blew my mind. And it was Myst. Uh, that's the guys who developed Myst, right? Now, you can get Myst, by the way, uh, for uh, VR. I haven't gotten it yet, but I want to because I want to see how that'll look. So at a time, Active Worlds had over 80 worlds devoted to education. Uh, it was pretty a pretty amazing spot. Once we get into this area, suddenly things start to explode, as everybody knows. Uh, and you get lots of these environments. Some of them are very social environments. I don't know if anybody here has been in Habo. It used to be called Habo Hotel. Uh, ooh, if I'm remembering right, I think it was started by someone in Finland. There are Habo hotels that are focused on speakers of Spanish and English and a number of, of other languages as well. So not a lot of educational use in Habo, but for informal language learning, for people who are focused on language learning, it's an interesting spot because you can have your students go to a Habo hotel that uh, the users are primarily Spanish speakers and they'll really be immersed in that language. Uh, one other advantage of Habo compared to some like Second Life is is they boba things, right? <laughs> you know, boba, uh, boba is what happens if you go into Habo and somebody types a swear word, they recognize it as a swear word and they change it into boba instead. It uh, doesn't always work, but uh, I think in this quote, in this room, I think it's in Spanish. And if I remember right, one of the characters, I can't quite make it out on my screen, but it says, uh, hola, uh, Algo aquí quiere boba? <laughs> hey, somebody here want a boba? Uh, I'm not sure what that was, but something inappropriate, I'm sure. Uh, for kids, of course, uh, people looked at environments like Club Penguin to do things. The issue with some of these, like Habo and Club Penguin, compared to environments like, like Second Life or Open Sim, though, is the, the amount of customization you could do is, is actually quite limited. It's one of the things I love about Second Life. 
because if you come into an environment like Second Life, some of you have been here a lot, some of you are quite new, I know, but one of the advantages of Second Life, and this will connect to the metaverse later, almost everything you see in Second Life, as you guys know, was built by users, not by the company. That's one of the very interesting things philosophically in Second Life. They provided the platform, they provided the structure, but almost everything you see, ranging from clothing to these rocks that we're standing on to here you see a, a site called Ancient Kyoto. I think it's still around where I went to this site. Uh, people are, are speaking in Japanese. Uh, I met a cat <laughs> there. The cat had the role of a community translator. So if there are people who were there who did not speak Japanese, who spoke English for the most part, uh, that person was willing to help people out to communicate with other people. But that wonderful building in the background, that was built by the owners of ancient Kyoto. And some of you probably know this other sim, uh, Avalon. Here you see I'm there in a very poorly created guise of a hobbit, uh, maybe a little too tall for a hobbit, uh, since I'm almost two meters in real life. But another avatar is there who's the dragon. And, and off to the left, she was shy. She want, did not want to be in, in the, the picture, was this uh, amazing kind of water sprite floating in a bubble of water. Uh, and we're chatting there in this, this wonderful sim. So, you know, there's, there's these amazing things that can happen in these environments, as we know, whether you're in the languages or... When I first came to Edunation, my next door neighbor was somebody who was studying uh, genetics. And what he was using Second Life for was to create uh, replications of DNA strands so that he could bring his students into this world and explore DNA in this very uh, 3D, 3D way. So the customization to me for education, uh, it's it's 100% key. It lets me build things uh, that I want. So if you do ever come over to Edunation, which is open to any educator, no matter your field, uh, uh, we've got something like 120 scenes in a holodeck there now, uh, which means there's circles on the ground. You can click it and you can choose from a menu of things ranging from meeting places to uh, airports to uh, uh, you name it. We've got a bunch of different ones there. That's to me is a strength in virtual worlds like this. So there's there's an image Actually, kind of an old image of sec Edunation on the left-hand side. And, and there I am in uh, one of the builds I made that I really love, uh, which is called, a, uh, arrogantly, I called it Chateau Renoir <laughs> to, to get my name into the build. But again, as educators, if anybody wants to come and explore, uh, I'm happy to meet with people. Uh, if anybody wants to use the space to teach a lesson, perfectly happy with that as well. Uh, if somebody wants to have, uh, you know, their more set space, uh, we, we rent out plots of land, but it's, people can use it. it uh, it's totally up to you. Uh, so let's get back to what I actually had on my title slide, because the question is, what is the metaverse? Uh, and I think that's a really interesting question. And if, if you look online, you're going to find so much about the metaverse. So what I can tell you for sure is, the metaverse will revolutionize everything uh, if you buy this book for $27 or $14.99 on the Kindle. Uh, well, I'm not sure what that means, but if we go to the next slide, you can see in addition, uh, the metaverse will be the next big thing. By the way, I have no idea why the colors <laughs> On these two covers, they're almost exactly the same. I'm not sure what happens with that. Uh, but yeah, it's the next big thing. So if, if you snooze, uh, you're really going to meta lose. Uh, these were all from Amazon. Amazon has so much in it right now on the metaverse. It's, uh, it's a little mind-blowing. Uh, here's... Here's some other important stuff on the metaverse. Uh, so there's so many ways on the metaverse, clearly, that uh, you can get rich 
So this was based on a search of the metaverse, blockchain wars, future of big tech monopolies, uh, the NFT handbook, uh, metaverse investing, metaverse investing, metaverse for beginners, metaverse investing for beginners. I think to be safe, yeah, you probably have to buy all these books so that you don't you don't lose out on this on this next big thing. Yeah, and as somebody put in the chat, admittedly, uh, NFTs are hot right now. Absolutely, uh, <laughs> some of them, some of them, ridiculous. Uh, but absolutely, absolutely, yeah. That's uh, it's a very interesting world we live in right now. Uh, but but what does this all really mean? Because you know you've made it, as you can see here, when you're even getting mentioned by Forbes magazine. So here we have on the left hand side an image from Forbes talking about the digital land grab. Metaverse real estate prices rose 700% in 2021. Or the other one, the price of virtual land NFTs in the metaverse is skyrocketing. But is the market overheating? Those of us who have been in Second Life for a while know the answer to that is yes, <laughs> the market is definitely overheating. Uh, I, I remember hearing this in the news. This uh, On the left-hand side, it talks about this. December 2021, a fan of the musician Snoop Dogg, you can see the arrows there, and hey, I love Snoop Dogg, don't get me wrong, but this fan paid $450,000 to purchase virtual land in the metaverse next to Dogg's virtual property in Ethereum. <laughs> That's a... I wish I had $450,000. I don't, sadly. But, you know, this right now, I think we're at a stage with this whole idea of the metaverse um, in a similar way to when Second Life came in. Uh, there's going to be this, there's this massive hype. I think it's going to die down and people are going to, um, for lack of a better term, reject it, but they're going to reject it prematurely, uh, as I think happened in Second Life, honestly. There was so much hype in Second Life, it was gonna change everything. And it didn't change everything, but it does some really, really interesting things. And uh, I think it's a bit unfortunate that people have ignored that. Uh, but how do you really, really know you've made it? Well, you've really made it with your idea when Hollywood picks it up. Right? So <laughs> some of you probably saw one or both of these movies. I actually enjoyed both of them a lot. Uh, Ready Player One. Uh, is one movie that really connected to this idea of the metaverse. And the other one you see there, Free Guy, uh, which I found to be a, a wonderfully strange, in some ways, movie. Uh, for, for me, the point here is, ironically, I think the ones right now who are getting the metaverse the most right, it's Hollywood, uh, including the aspect of this kind of idea of rampant corporate greed that, that wants to control it. Uh, they've, to me, they're spot on in, in this respect. And well, I guess that's, that's life sometimes. So what are we left with right now? This kind of logical, inevitable end result uh, being the billionaire battle for the metaverse where rather than necessarily battling for space, they're doing that as well. Maybe the next great battle will be for uh, meta space, I guess we could say, uh, because clearly we have people uh, who are trying to come up with their own version of what they think the metaverse should be. But I don't necessarily think they understand really what the metaverse is all about, because None of these things really tell us what the metaverse actually is. Uh, some of you probably know, based on something that you've read, what the original idea between the, about the metaverse was, because it comes from this book, uh, Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. I'm curious, has, has anybody read that? If you've read it, just put like maybe a Y in the chat window or something. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, so many people have read it. Right. It's really considered a classic now. Twice. Yeah, I've read it several times as well. Super interesting book, right? 1992, uh, Neil Stevenson, in this book, he uses the term metaverse 
really in this uh, focus for the first time. Uh, so what is the metaverse for Neil Stevenson? So if we if we look here, here's a quote, uh, a couple quotes. I'll, I'll read them out in my my most dulcet tones. Uh, Hero spends his free time in a world where he is not seeing real people, of course. This is all a part of the moving illustration drawn by his computer, according to specifications, coming down the fiber optic cable. Ooh, early mention of fiber optics. The people are pieces of software called avatars. They are the audio-visual bodies that people use to communicate with each other in the metaverse. Right? There's his idea of the metaverse. Uh, by the way, some people claim this novel was the first to use the term avatar. That's not true, because <laughs> we already saw the first use of avatar for this sort of environment, which was for Habitat. That's what Habitat called the people in there. Those were avatars, and remember that was long uh, before them. Uh, another favorite of mine in here on the screen uh, that should sound very familiar to people, there's something new, a globe about the size of a grapefruit, a perfectly detailed rendition of planet Earth, hanging in space at arm's length in front of his eyes. Hero had heard about this, but had never seen it. It's a piece of CIC, uh, con uh, Control and Information Center, software called simply Earth. It is the user interface that CIC uses to keep track of every bit of spatial information that it owns. All the maps, weather data, architectural plans, and satellites, satellite surveillance stuff. As I say, Google Earth, is that you? In fact, the creators of Google Earth freely admit that they are very influenced by this book when creating that. So this metaverse for Stevenson, especially so many of you have read it, you know this is an environment that connects this virtual world with the real world and beyond, right? They can inhabit this world. They can live in this world. They can interact with this world in very, very interesting ways. And our main character uh, in this book, you saw his name is Hero. This tells you something about Stevenson's sense of humor, right? Because the main character or hero of the story is named, the Japanese name, Hero. And what's his last name? Hero protagonist. <laughs> right, right. Uh, what does he do? He delivers pizza for the mob. And in his spare time, he plugs into the metaverse. Uh, <laughs> that's great. I love that stuff. So, here we have this this book, 1992, that brings out these ideas for the first time, except it, it doesn't bring these ideas out for the first time. Some of you may have read this story, but I bet you not nearly as many. Put a, put a Y in the chat if you have read Pygmalion's Spectacles. What a, what a modern kind of title that is. All right, we're still getting, uh, I see some people, great. Well, here we see, in some wiles, right? Here is Pygmalion Spectacles. As you can see, if you're looking closely at the screen, 1935, 1935. Yeah, you can find this online. I should have put in a link. Uh, look for it, it's, it's old enough, it's, it's out of copyright. You can find it. Uh, so 1935, <laughs> when as I say in my notes to myself, unlike today, of course, one of the first uses of the technology was try to meet to try to meet scantily clad women, as you can see in the the right hand uh, lens of that spectacle. Uh, men, we never change. Uh, but unlike some of what some of us used to see uh, who got comic books, remember in the back of the comic books there was also the ad for the the X-ray glasses that was going to let you see through people's clothes. Uh, yeah, that didn't work. Uh, but these are not simply spectacles for this book, as you'll see in this quote uh, from one of the main characters. Uh, the main character, who's the older guy you see in the other spectacle. So remember, this is 1935. This is what's very cool to me. Uh, so here's this quote. Listen, I'm Albert Ludwig, Professor Ludwig. 
As Dan was silent, he continued, it means nothing to you, eh? But listen, a movie that gives one sight and sound. Suppose now that I add taste, smell, even touch, if your interest is taken by the story. Suppose I make it so that you are in the story. You speak to the shadows, and the shadows reply. And instead of being on a screen, the story's all about you, and you are in it. Would that be to make real a dream? I, I, I love it. 1935. That, by the way, is 39 years before the invention of the holodeck in Star Trek the Animated Series. Uh, 57 years before Snow Crash and 60 years before Active Worlds. I think I just saw somebody mention, yeah, somebody mentioned Metropolis 1927, uh, which, oh boy, if you've not seen the movie Metropolis, you're, you're missing out. Talk about a classic. Uh, and the robot, the robot is, is magnificent in there. So my, my point here is, again, some of these things that we consider new are, are not new at all. Even some of the original ideas we think are new are not new at all. And you can go back and see some of these. Uh, this is a short story, well worth reading. <laughs> but so this leaves that question. What the heck then is the metaverse? As you can see, you break down the word. Uh, meta from the ancient Greek uh, could be more comprehensive, transcending or beyond. I think that's the, the best one, beyond universe is universe beyond the universe so it's a universe that goes beyond the one we live in today i think that makes sense that's simple enough uh but it doesn't really give some of the depth uh but still to me here's the problem uh by my definition as you'll see on the next slide i think uh, the metaverse clearly does not exist yet. What's happening right now is you're getting companies using metaverse the same way that they use terms like AI or digital. One of my favorite examples, Dyson vacuums, ooh, the digital motor. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> the motor has a, has a microchip that runs it just like every motor nowadays, but ooh, it's digital. It sounds great. Or I've seen uh, 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 ads for these these sunglasses, right? And the sunglasses are advertised as HD sunglasses, high definition sunglasses. Really? <laughs> Come on. Uh, or AI gets thrown around all the time right now. And the fact is, we don't have AI yet. If you look at the classic definitions of AI, uh, we don't have truly thinking an AI toaster. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, so it gets used all the time. But let's be honest, Mark Zuckerberg's view of the metaverse is not a view of the metaverse. Uh, it's one that's really designed instead for profit for the company. There's nothing wrong with profit. But by my definition, we do not yet have the, the metaverse. So here's what I think the metaverse should include. And for me, uh, when I was putting this slide together, this is coming from books like Snow Crash. It's coming from what we have today. And it's coming from what I've read from other people as well. So I, I am calling this my, <laughs> my metaverse manifesto. I sound like the Unabomber. I apologize. Uh, but I think there are three components here. Right? There's essential. These are kind of the philosophical components that need to be in the metaverse. Uh, you also have just some of the general characteristics that are always important. And then you have platforms that it would involve. Now, here's the key thing here, I think, before I describe these. Imagine for a minute the internet, if it was impossible to travel between the Amazon site and the Wikipedia site or between almost any of the major sites. That wouldn't be the internet, right? It wouldn't be the internet at all. So the big point on this slide is the metaverse needs to be thought of as, in some ways, the meta net, right? Uh, beyond the internet. It's a, it's a fully immersive, 
internet where everything is connected. So this would allow you to be here in Second Life and then seamlessly move over to Pokemon Go or, or one of us, uh, or maybe uh, in the future, the University of Illinois virtual campus to attend a class. But not just move, right? You could do all of that using the same avatar and your inventory in a fully immersive mode. Uh, one of my pet peeves, I've got so such a huge inventory here in Second Life. Let me see. I'm, I'm seeing where I am right now. Uh, I've got like 60,000 items in my inventory, uh, and I cleaned it out recently. Uh, so you'd be able to move anything from your inventory. So think about this, that, that amazing flying car, maybe that you bought in Second Life. You could drive it over to Grand Theft Auto. Uh, to help with your doing chaos there. Yeah, somebody says only 60,000. I used to have three or four times that, but uh, I finally did some extensive cleaning because it was I couldn't find anything. Uh, so to borrow a phrase, when I think about the metaverse, uh, I, I <laughs> melodramatically, I hold these truths to be self-evident. Uh, now, some of these, I think, will be really familiar to those of us who have been working or, or teaching in immersive environments like Second Life. But then there's these key differences. Uh, and these differences explain why I don't think we currently have a metaverse or, or why, given the way things are going right now with businesses, I'm not sure if we ever will. Um, so here's what I think you need to make a valid claim to a, a, a metaverseosity. Uh, look on the right hand side first. Like now has to have open access and it has to be persistent. Uh, you could say that you could make that argument for Second Life, right? Anybody can come in. Uh, if you log out, it's still there. Should be hardware agnostic. Many of them are, not not all. Portability of items and avatars, uh, it's, it's not really there. Many creators, some settings have this, some don't. It's an overlay of the real world and beyond. So not just in Second Life, but uh, the metaverse, you could also interact with the real world at the second time, and everything needs to be connected. This is that uh, Web X.0 sort of an idea. So some of these we have, some of these we don't. Characteristics, interactivity, we've got that here, but the interactivity uh, in the metaverse has even more depth. Um, you, you can perceive uh, the interactivity. Uh, if you touch something, you, you feel it. Avatars, uh, highly, highly immersive. Some do better jobs than that with others. And for the platforms, uh, VR, of course, would be part of it, but also augmented reality. Uh, and again, augmented reality, uh, think of like Google Glasses, where you put those on and, and text overlays come in and that sort of thing. Also mixed reality. Uh, mixed reality, um, think like Microsoft HoloLens. Right, so you are interacting with the real world and 3D object at the same time. And then another one, which is my dream <laughs> in the future, which would be something called a neural reality. Right? No more headset. <laughs> Maybe you just have a jack in the back of your head, like in the Matrix. I don't know if I'd want that, uh, but uh, that's, <laughs> that sort of thing I think would be pretty nice. Uh, so these are some of these factors. And so... Let, let, let's talk about what we really have right now that some of us are using right now. If we don't have a metaverse, uh, where are we now? How are we going to get there? Well, what we do have right now uh, is our, our cool friend, virtual reality, VR. And when I think of VR, I think of it in two ways. And some of these ideas come from my friend, uh, Regina kaplan Rakowski. Uh, low immersion VR I think we're in that right now, right? This is our programs like Second Life, right? You're looking at the computer screen. And then high immersion. Many of you have been in VR headsets. That's where you're, you got a headset, you're in the 360 space. I'm doing some research in this area uh, right now. Uh, so this is kind of where we're, we're at. And some of you have used some of these spaces. I'm curious, again, throw, throw some things in the chat if you've used any of these spaces. Uh, there's so many right now. They're popping up like like mad. But here's just a few. Uh, some of you may have been in Decentraland. Right? There's somebody who has. Somebody's been in three of the four. Nice bonus points. Sandbox, Somnium Space, 
Horizon Worlds, which honestly I'm kind of disappointed in so far. I don't know who else has been in Horizon Worlds, but uh, I know it's still in progress, but I've been that thrilled with it at, at this point anyway. Or others. Uh, I did some uh, research. Horizon Worlds is a virus. Wow. <laughs> don't hold back. <laughs> right. Uh, some others that uh, I've done some research in so far, uh, VR Chat, uh, Mozilla Hubs, which uh, honestly makes me want to throw up when I go in there in a headset. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, v Time, limited, but an interesting space. Uh, there's a lot of them designed for businesses. Spatial's one of them, but there's so many. Uh, I forgot to include Zoom, right? <laughs> We've all been living on Zoom lately, right? Uh, Alcove. Who's used Alcove? Anybody? Here's the weird thing about Alcove. Alcove was designed by the American Association of Retired People, <laughs> which is weird, right? But it's a house, and it's a really good space, actually. It's worth looking into. And alt space, of course, is one of the big ones. So why aren't these? Why aren't these the metaverse? Well, you know, if, if we look, if we go back to my chart, if we look back at my chart, here's why these aren't. <laughs> because the items that are circled in red uh, are things that aren't quite there yet, depending on the platform. But there's they're missing, especially things like everything is connected. Overlay of the real world and beyond, portability. Uh, this is where we're certainly not at the metaverse yet. And again, my concern is the way these are all being developed by companies and companies and companies, well, you know, F Facebook, they're not going to want to connect with another company and, and let people move in between them and take their take their things with them. Um, I think about this in terms of what if the at, what if the Internet had not been invented until today? I don't know if we'd ever get it like we have now. So uh, my time is quickly running out. So I want to give a quick mention here of some research that I'm actually doing right now uh, with a, a student. She just graduated, now she's Dr. Thrasher at Illinois with my primary research partner, Melinda Dooley over in Barcelona uh, and a classroom teacher there, Monica, uh, who's a wonderful teacher. I call her a cat herder because she's working with sixth graders. So we're, we're teaching 24 very, very, very energetic sixth grade students in Barcelona using VR. Uh, and clearly, I'm not going to have a lot of time to go over this because I want to I want to open up time for questions. Uh, but we use a platform called Immerse uh, that some of you may be familiar with uh, to work with these kids. Uh, don't don't be deceived. There are so many platforms right now that are like Immerse, Immerse VR, Immersive. <laughs> it's all Immerse something. This is just one called Immerse. This was designed specifically four teachers to teach English to groups of students in VR. Uh, so it has some elements that we find really useful. I'm going to skip a slide here because I don't know. Talk about that. I'll let this one res. Uh, some of the things that they have in here as that slide is resing, they have 34 different locations or experiences. Airport arrival, backyard barbecue, city central, uh, Wizard's Classroom is my favorite. Uh, it's for the Oculus Quest 2. Maximum seven students in a lesson, which, you know, you might think, what the, only seven students. Let me tell you, when you're working with sixth graders <laughs> in VR, suddenly seven seems like a plenty. Uh, that, hence the comment about herding cats. Uh, some customizable uh, customizability is available and they're going to increase that. Well, we've been talking with the company. To me, one of the big limitations is usage is based on the teachers paying, their idea being that you're going to be having students come in and they're going to pay your lessons. Uh, I'm not sure if that model will continue. Uh, for our research, we took these kids into four locations uh, so far in Immerse. You can see uh, one of them is a grand hall with a dragon skull sticking out of it. Uh, there's an art studio. Uh, also, uh, we looked at uh, a garage that had kind of sports related stuff uh, and a house, kitchen, all these sorts of things. So we were brainstorming with the teacher, what kind of vocabulary do the students need to learn? What kind of grammatical structures do they need to learn? And with that, 
we used uh, the teacher interface in Immerse because one nice thing is for all of these settings, they've already developed lessons, but you can also create your own lessons, uh, which is really nice uh, and, and very useful for us. And there you can see the teacher interface and the lesson interface. Uh, the teacher platform looks like this. The teacher normally joins from a uh, monitor rather than a VR headset because that way, oh, it's about to get noisy. We're having somebody come to our house and my beagle is probably going to go crazy from enjoyment and do crazy barking noises. So pardon, pardon the noise. You can see in the teacher interface, they have access to everything related from animations. They can change their characters. Um, they can do video chat so the students will actually see their real face. Rally the students to bring them to you because herding cats. Uh, things you can put out. There's lots of things that uh, you can put out in this system, uh, which we really like. Uh, a whiteboard, scoreboard, sticky notes, images, YouTube videos, slides. Uh, and there are things like uh, instant messages and a timer. You can manage the students, their voice, what teams they're in, all sorts of different things. So I'm, I'm almost out of time here. So uh, we're, this progress, uh, this is still in progress, you know, uh, so we don't, I'm not going to talk really about findings, I think, at this point, other than to say the, uh, the teacher perspective, the student perspective, and what we're finding so far quantitatively, uh, it's been a very effective tool. Students who don't normally talk are talking. The students are talking a lot. They're interacting with objects and us, the teachers in this platform. Here you can see them in the art studio where uh, the task in, in this time was there were a stack of cards. They'd have to grab a card, draw whatever was on that card on the board and label it, and then grab another card, add to it, add to it, add to it. So this one you see on the right hand side there from Marsal, uh, when he was describing this later, he's talking about, I drew a triangle on the triangle. I drew two mushrooms and then I, bah, 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 all these things that he added onto it. These are sixth graders, remember, low, low level sixth graders, but they're producing just incredible amounts of language, which was wonderful for us. So um, I'm going to I'm going to stop there and and I don't I don't know if anybody put anything on the padlet but I'm almost out of time anyway. So I'm going to temporarily skip over that to say to everyone uh thank you so much for coming. Uh there's my email address. Uh if if people have connections, if people want to uh stop by uh education sometime, uh, you're certainly welcome uh to come. I'm I'm happy to show people around. If you like building stuff, I love building stuff together. I'm happy to do that. Uh, I do have, I'm going to skip back to here in a second. I do have one more slide. Scan that if you'd like. Uh, there's a bibliography that goes with this. Um, I didn't want to just uh, uh, send it to everybody because how, how boring is a bibliography. But if, if you want it, uh, it's there. You're most welcome to get it. They'll probably put it in chat as well. And uh, I'll go back to the slide with my image. So, uh, again, I, I'm probably thank out of time here, but thank you ever so <laughs> much. Randall. It truly has been a time travel. My goodness, uh, we've really enjoyed so many references to all these pre versions of the metaverse, and especially your metaverse uh, manifesto, which is really. Um, put everything together in a nutshell of what the metaverse should be. Thank you ever so much, Randall. Oh, no, may my I pleasure. Encourage, may I encourage the audience to, perhaps if you have questions, to post them on the Padlet that Randall um, put out. And some of you have already replied on the Padlet. I've given you the link again in the text. Right? Thank you ever so much. It's been such a pleasure, Randall. You're oh, wonderful. Absolutely. Absolutely, my pleasure. Uh, and as I said, anybody ever wants to drop me an email, uh, I'm always happy to chat. Uh, I'm actually doing a, a project right now, and I've got people joining in from various places, which is to use an uh, interactive fiction creation uh, tool called Twine that some of you may be familiar with. We're using Twine to create a, a interactive fiction based story that we we hope will integrate uh, perhaps 360 images and movies based around a local 
mansion called Allerton House uh, that's now owned by the University of Illinois, which was owned by a really interesting character in the early 1900s. Uh, who ended up adopting his partner so that the, his partner could inherit. And we're going to do a make a 1920s murder mystery in, in there. So, again, if people are interested, uh, drop me a message. We're starting to have meetings for that actually starting today. Uh, U.S. Central Time, 8 a.m. and also ooh, 4 p.m. or 5 p.m. I can't remember which it was. One second. Uh, 4 p.m so that people can join from Europe and, and Asia as well. So I know I'm out of time. So thank you so much. Uh, and I'm happy to chat with people. Any can you perhaps pull out the uh, QR code of the Padlet perhaps one more time? I'm already uh, in the chat, but uh, I'm really wrapping it up here now. Thank sure. you ever so much, uh, everyone, for attending. Okay, here it is.